it's academic and it's theater, and it's a place where they both meet. Oh boy. We have the audience and our students for each Examples of women sharing what it is they do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore that feelings anymore. Work from all over the world. You can come and see and talk about it. What time is it now? Can you? Start out about different people and about different things. A whole sea of phenomena. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what can be done. That's the very important thing. And indeed, I understand the life relationship that I've already seen. Hooray! 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 Welcome, everybody, to the Martin Siegel Theater Center. And yes, this is Richard Chagner, who was at the end of our clip, and he came today with the class. So uh, we made it, and, um, and so we are uh, really uh, honored to have you here, and everybody, uh, for all of you to know. As far as we know, it's your last class at NYU uh, te teaching, so it's a big, uh, another big sea change about next to many many others. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the executive director and director of programs of the Siegel Center together with Antje Oegel, Freebridge Academy and Professional Theater. And of course, the Pig Iron uh, Theater Company, which we have many times here as guests, is the center of our work. Antje worked closely with um, Dan and, uh, and uh, others to put this together. So tell us a little bit about the evening, what we're going to see, and what we're going to hear. Thank you. Well, a big welcome from me as well. So we're really happy that all of you are here. Um, yeah, this is a very special evening for us because Big Iron, I think, um, inhabits a very unique place in the theatrical landscape of this country, but also abroad. Um, so we're really honored to have the, 20, the, the New York edition of the 20 year celebration of Pig Iron here um, at the Siegel Theater Center. So you already had a bunch of activities in Philadelphia, your hometown where you're from. Um, so 20 years of uh, continued excellent work, that's a big achievement for any company. And Pig Iron was really able over the course of the years to keep their uh, curiosity and um, develop their craft and their aesthetic. Um, so uh, it, we all know that a theater company is a, is a living <coughs> organism. People come and people go, they leave their imprint and um, they take something with them. And I really think it speaks um, to or for the um, artistic leadership and artistic vision of Dan Rothenberg and Dieter von Reichersberg. Um, that so many people that have worked with the company went on and started their own company, taking part of that aesthetic with them. So um, without a lot more to say, I want to hand over the microphone to Dito and also Rebecca Rock, who will moderate yeah. the evening. And you have been affiliated with the company for many years as well. So but we will hear about that. Great. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Which one? Hey everyone. <laughs> so that one's over. Dan. <laughs> this one's Dito. I'm Rebecca. My affiliation with Pig Iron Theater Company is mostly as like number one fan. Um, so I feel really honored to be up here tonight to um, lead a discussion with these guys. Um, so I became a fan when I was working at the Public Theater, and I saw their work for the first time in the um, Wax Factory Festival, Ice, Ice Factory, Factory. Ice yeah. Factory Festival. Um, <laughs> Wax Factory is a whole different thing. Anyway, um, and I just fell in love with them and was able to bring them to the public for residency, and then have been friends ever since, and have been a big admirer. So I think. Um, that's enough to say about me with relation to them. I think what we really want to hear tonight is um, just about the 20 years of this company. So when Ancha was just saying 20 years of continued excellence, Dan leaned over to me and said some of it was really spotty. <laughs> and I feel like that's actually part of the story that we need to hear about. Not just that, you know, um, like some of the work is good and some of the work is not as good, and that's part of what happens over 20 years, but also, um, you know, they're kind of ability to be funny and wry in thinking about their own you know, history. I think that is like a helpful thing um, to, to know that we're going to hear about. So I'd like to just kick it to you and have you guys tell us the origin story of Pig Iron Theater Company. How did you start? 
So there's uh, actually a, a third of us uh, who have been doing this together for 21-ish years now. So Dido, myself, and Quinn Baradell uh, were students together at Swarthmore College, which is a little uh, small college outside of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, I think it's safe to say that it is a pretty nerdy college uh, with a real focus on mm -hmm. There's, there's an alum, <laughs> uh, uh, with a focus on, on book learning. Uh, and um, we started the company in 1995. Um, very soon after, Quinn, Barlow, Quinn and I went to uh, the Lecoq School in Paris, uh, Jacques Lecoq School in Paris, where we met people from 40 different countries, and we brought back a few Europeans and some Americans that we met there, and that became the core of the com company in like 97, 98, and that was our ensemble for a while. Um, I guess I'm curious what you would say. I feel like the things that we were thinking about, uh, I was very inspired by the work of Joseph Chaikin. Uh, I was uh, talking earlier today about the fact that I had the strange good fortune to have a high school teacher who had been, I guess what, they didn't have the word intern then, but he was an intern with Joe Chaikin's <laughs> theater company. Uh, Joe Chaikin started a theater called the Open Theater from 63 to 73. And then when we arrived at Swarthmore, one of our professors, Alan Kuharski, had also made work with Joe in the 80s. Um, so we were pretty steeped in Joe's book, The Presence of the Actor. Um, and his focus on the ensemble. So I didn't know that that was such a strange thing, um, but that was something that I cared about a lot. And then I guess the other thing that was happening was I'd, I'd worked like even in high school with some people who were part of the new vaudeville movement of the 90s. Um, so Bill Irwin was a real hero of mine and this uh, idea of theater clowning, which Lecoq is also connected to, mm. was, was an inspiration. So I guess we were, I, I sort of can't believe how young we were. We were 21 years old and we were looking at the open theater and Teatro du Soleil, Manushkin's company in Paris and saying, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're just gonna do that. We're just gonna <laughs> work on making our own uh, ensemble created pieces and, uh, and that's what we'll do. And at first um, we were only in the summer times. We were at Swarthmore, speaking of Swarthmore College, Swarthmore College, um, allowed us to rehearse uh, and live in the summer times uh, and make a piece. And yeah, the way I like to talk about that is it was such a nerdy place that um, they had just built a performing arts center that they really didn't have any staff or use for. Uh, <laughs> that, that Eugene Lang is sort of the biggest philanthropist of that place and he said, I want to build a performing arts center. And uh, the administration said, we'd really love anything but that <laughs> and that then he said you're not going to get any more money from me until we do that so that happened and then quickly they built a theater program around that and then in the summer it was sitting there empty with the air conditioning on and the lights on yes. uh, and, and they would rent it Hold out for, for two weeks to for like little kids to do ballet competitions but otherwise this like gorgeous Black box was sitting there, so we started sort of so trying I was to sort after of my ballet competitions in. were done. <laughs> then, <laughs> yeah. then we were terrific. I was very good. I could spin a lot, and then uh, really dominated those little kids. <laughs> I, I, was, I knocked them physically over. Uh, no, uh, and then, but but so we rehearsed in the summertime, and then we, um, for the first two summers of of Pig Iron, we would rehearse um, six weeks maybe. Yeah, and then we would go to Edinburgh and um, perform as a company there. Speaking of highs and low, <laughs> lows, um, the first, so we didn't know about Edinburgh, how it worked, but we heard it was like the largest arts festival in the world. So we were like, let's go. Um, if I've won all these ballet competitions, I can surely go to Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went, we didn't know many important things, but one thing is that you don't usually have an intermission in a show at the Edinburgh Fringe, because everyone's like going from show to show, and it's like maybe an hour they'll give you their, their attention, then they have to go to the next show. So we made a show that had an intermission. It was two hours long? Yeah. And speaking of nerds, the first show we ever made was called The Odyssey, colon. <laughs> a, a new work of theater and dance. 
so, uh, so we did, we did this show. Often the person who went at, the, the group that went after us would often threaten us with bodily harm because they were like, you went over again. You went over again. Because you had like two hour slots, including get in and get out. Um, and the first time we performed in Edinburgh, well, just getting the show up, um, we also had a case of food poisoning that traveled through the entire company. So we were all throwing up. And then, and then uh, we were like, OK, this is it, the first show. And five people came. Sure. That's about <laughs> normal for Edinburgh. And then maybe three. And then, <laughs> and then we got this five-star review. So that, that was the miracle of all miracles. So that was, that launched us in our tiny. Uh, I am sort of surprised thinking about how narrow our horizons were, heading out to Edinburgh, really not knowing anything about producing or much about the professional theater at all. And I guess Edinburgh was sort of the perfect place, at, especially at that time in the '90s, for upstarts to do that because it really was a mix. First of all, there was this international festival, which we got to see over the years that we were there, which brought us in contact with people like uh, Pina Bausch and Netherlands Dance Theater and people in this dance theater world that we were looking at. Uh, and then also, I I'm, I'm guess I'm thinking back to that time and realizing that Diane Paulus had just started her one show, The Donkey Show, was happening in 96 or 97, 96 or or around then. And that um, well, there were a couple that Shunt was doing one of their first or second shows. They're a pretty big site-specific company in London. Um, I'm trying to think who else was in those days. I mean, it, the Edinburgh Festival has kind of corporatized, or the Edinburgh Fringe has kind of corporatized in the 20 years since then. There's a much bigger focus on comedy and on branding, and there's big um, sort of beer gardens. But mm -hmm. at that time, it was the, it really, I think we were there really at a, at a sweet spot moment where, first of all, for Americans going abroad, the, the exchange rate worked in our favor so that we could bring over this $200 show and see a bunch of stuff for $5 here and $5 there. Uh, and really that every, every cafe and basement turned into a theater. Mm -hmm. um, but I just thought, I think having, having sort of touched, you were there actually just recently. Do you agree that it's pretty oh, different? Oh, it's gotten very different. And there's these uh, gigantic, like the, what is it called? The Gilded Balloon is like a whole <laughs> world of, of <coughs> small theaters. As a they were much more kind of independent. Every, every venue was its own independent thing. And then I think larger venues started to like grab whole theaters, <laughs> I mean, whole groups of, of venues. So can I jump in and say, I mean, it's pretty interesting to hear kind of who else was there at that time. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, I don't know how you started to come to think of your style or lack of style as a company or what you were about. I mean, Dan, you just said you really were drawn to theater clowning. And I'm interested between theater clowning and the things that you were seeing while you were there, what you started to make of yourselves and what you wanted to make in relation to those things you were seeing. Like, what are your compass points, I guess, yeah. in aesthetic? Mm. So when we started the company, we called ourselves a dance clown theater company. And the work was the performers and creators that we were drawing together. We wanted to get folks who had different points of view on that. Um, so we were, I kind of, I don't know. I want to talk about clown a little more later. But so I, I, I guess. We thought about clown not as a uh, circus, but as specifically this style of performance where the audience, where, where the, the performer can see the audience. And that really that that was this muscle that you could work. And I think that came somewhat from Lecoq and somewhat from some of the other new vaudeville people in the 90s. But that that was how we made a distinction between this performance style of clown and this performance style of theater. And basically, we were thinking about the study of the contact with the audience as clown, the study of character starting from a physical basis for theater, mm -hmm. and then uh, taking some of the, um, being willing to dip into uh, another kind of performance which was more, I guess I'll say musical or geometric when we were thinking about dance, 
but I think we, I don't know, I don't know, I think we were also just wanting people who were interested in that kind of physical training to work with us. And so the early work that we made was really like collages, like this Odyssey, a new work of theater and dance, um, <laughs> kind of shifted from mode to mode. Um, and with a lot of like silhouette style characters. Yeah, again, yes, silhouette style, large approach, uh, approach to character, pretty influenced by Lecoq's teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point over those like early five years, we started to talk about let's not make collages, let's make a complete world um, on stage and a, and a kind of internal piece of vocabulary that we would use. And I don't know where we picked this up is that we would go to the, the regular theater and say, well, that person isn't in the same play as that person. Um, that these two people are in different plays and that one of the things that we prided ourselves on was that everybody was in the same play and that the way to do that was to not start with a script but to let the script be born from the performers and have the performers be in a constant dialogue with the director, the writer, and the designers so that people had a, I guess I'll say an intellectual understanding of what the style was. Uh, and what the world was um, that everybody could keep working on and keep investing in. And I would, I would say that because um, we improvise a lot in order to make what we're making, um, I think that's also a moment where the, the um, wrestling over what the style is gets worked out because there's a sort of like, um, uh, there, some values start getting articulated in terms of like what was successful about this, what wasn't su successful about this, how are these characters now in the same play together and how, how are those working together. So there's, um, in pig iron shows, I'm going to say 99% of the time, there's no improvisation. Like on stage. On stage. There's no set. I mean, there's no, um, there's nothing that's not set. But a lot of what you see has come to be after a lot of improvisation has happened in the rehearsal room. So um, I feel like that's a way in which, um, so, so different than picking up a, 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 a script and, and trying to figure out what the playwright was thinking, it's really like, OK, what were we all thinking in the space, and how can we put a finer and finer point on, on the world that we're creating? Is there a time where you feel like you did that the best? Like, is there a most proud of? Uh, whole world that you created? Well, we just showed Chekhov Lizard Brain, which I think we were, we were pretty, I'm pretty proud of as a whole world. It's a very strange world. Um, that's a piece which takes place, I mean, it takes place inside somebody's head. Um, it was kind of inspired by, I mean, it was inspired by a bunch of different things, but we started getting pretty interested in outsider artists, visual artists, like around 2003. Um, so I guess really famous at that time was Henry Darger. So Henry Darger, a lot of people know, that somebody who um, made art just for themselves, you know, alone in, in his room. And there was this other guy named A.G. Rizzoli. And A.G. Rizzoli trained as a draftsman, and then he would make, he had a whole cosmology in his head, and he would make really intricate, fantastical drawings of people he knew imagined as buildings. And he would do drafting of them as buildings, and then he would do a show in his garage where he would just put them up in his garage and sell them for $5. And if someone <laughs> came in and said something nice to him from the neighborhood, the next year there would be a drawing of that person who said something nice to him as a, build as a person, as, as a building with um, it was this weird mix of sort of Art Deco World's Fair with spotlights and banners on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we were, we were interested in these artists who uh, are obsessed uh, and make their own elaborate fictions. Uh, so I feel like a bunch of the plays were about that, really were about this <sighs> characters making elaborate fictions which then get um, pulled away. At the end, they, the, 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 in that kind of um, Wizard of Oz, you were the scarecrow kind of way, or Usual Suspects, I guess we talked about also. That movie, The Usual, which I, I hope I'm not giving away the ending. <laughs> <laughs>
but it's not real. <laughs> uh, I don't know, the one that came to mind was Cafeteria. Mm. Cafeteria is a, is a show that we did after everyone finally came back from France. Everyone came back from Le Coq. And um, so, so Quinn had been there two years, and he was really like excited to talk about American culture. What is American culture? Because he'd been in France for two years. So um, we started talking about how can we talk about American culture and, and what's, a, what's, an, what's a performative constraint that we're excited about. And this was, um, I guess this was a time when we were very spry, but we, were, we wanted to make something that was um, all movement, no speaking. So we made this piece called Cafeteria, which takes place in a junior high cafeteria and then a corporate cafeteria and finally in a retirement home cafeteria. So it sort of takes you through a life cycle of an American human, um, but it has no words. So f speaking of acting states or like figuring out the, how, we, um, how we express ourselves without a language but, but are able to give a sense of a plot or something happening um, non-verbally, that was, that was one of the exciting challenges of that piece. And, and um, that was another one where like character became really important. And there were really funny constraints that I don't feel like you would necessarily know when you came in, but it allowed there to be this unity of style. So we made really specific constraints for that piece that it was going to have no words, but it wasn't going to be dance. So there really wasn't, so there were two things that we didn't allow. There wasn't any movement that was just decoration that was just there to show that it was pretty. Um, but we also didn't allow any speech substitute. So there was no like, <laughs> and there was no, um, hey, over here, you know, that we had to find other ways to get around that, which created a kind of streamlined style. I mean, recently I've, I've heard, I, Elevator Repair Service was starting in the 90s down at PS122, and we saw their early work as well, and I've heard them talk about formal dares. And I said, oh yeah, that, that was our thing as well. We wanted there to be these formal dares, and I think, like Elevator Repair Service, we tried not to have a house style. You know, we really didn't want we wanted to create a world with each play that required us to train in a slightly different way. And uh, it was almost like we felt like if you're an experimental theater company, you can't keep doing the same experiment over and over again. I'm kind of in a funny place with that in my 40s now. I mean, first of all, I, I sort of don't know if that's true because I think there are some people who you know we've built an audience in Philadelphia and they do start they I just don't know if there isn't something that runs through all of Pig Iron's work even though we tried so hard to reinvent ourselves each time mm. um, well I know for me I often have the sense of um, of the formal uh, of there being some rules that I don't know what they are when I'm watching and I am sometimes trying really hard to decode them and I am I'm, I'm happy when I'm unsuccessful actually like the code is never broken which I think is kind of an interesting way to think about it that I never have before mm -hmm. um, but I guess I would say I, I find that to be less and less so in the more recent work and I wonder if there are um, ways that you've moved away from that or are there new influences on you that have changed your your, I don't know, way in. Has your has your has your DNA like continue? You know, have you continued to have a new um, genealogy of influences as you've moved out of that first set of people that you saw at the Edinburgh Fringe over your time? I guess particularly, I'm thinking of Toshiki Okada, yep. but mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are other new people as well in your in your universe. I think there was a really important moment that Mimi, where Mimi, was involved. Um, so there was a piece called Love Unpunished, um, which was a piece set on a, it's hard to describe this piece, but um, it's a piece basically set on um, escape stairs Escape stairs in a, in a corporate building, the skyscraper. But then there's also an L-shape um, platform that, that surrounds that staircase that also gets used um, in terms of movement. And it was a piece that we created 
um, with a choreographer named David Brick. And I, I would say... Can I say just a little bit more about the piece, though? Just to... So yeah. it's... Um, yeah. It was five years after 9-11, and Katrina had just happened. And uh, I guess this will speak a little bit of just about a whole process, too. We were trying to make a play that actually came back eventually, Yuba City, I think, in some ways. where We wanted to return to this level of mask, masked level of play, and it was going to be about love. And we started training in mask, and, and one, a guy who came and trained us in mask had us all wear these black hoods before we were gonna work with these fun character masks. And something about seeing all the black hoods just made me uh, think about a, a sea of, of humanity. And, and Katrina happened and we just started talking about, uh, just about, another thing we talk about in the company is saying what isn't said, saying what can't be said. That that's an, another thing that we think about as our role of like, um, saying what hasn't been said or there isn't room. And sometimes that means not, sometimes that means something quiet, like it's too quiet to be said. And, and I guess I was thinking about, uh, in conversations with Dito and Quinn and this choreographer David Brick, I was thinking about how there was this moment uh, right after 9-11 that I was really haunted by thinking about the people coming down the stairs and not knowing if it was an emergency, like the people on the 60th floor. And then the firemen coming up, like thinking about firemen going up 50 or 60 stairs. And I just kept thinking about that um, and not being able to digest it, mm. really. And that, that by 2006, 2005, 2006, we were in the war with Iraq. And at that point, 9-11 became this banner. And so either you were for the war or you were against the war. And I felt like there was this huge disconnect between that feeling that I had that which David Brick called grief. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that feeling also that that grief connected me to all kinds of people. Um, I, I really remember going to West Africa like a couple of years or right after that, uh, I guess it was 2003, and seeing like a memorial calendar about uh, the, the World Trade Center and just trying to comprehend how people in West Africa uh, with so many fewer resources than the people in New York could have this feeling of grief around the, these people thousands of miles away, um, that something about those towers coming down had really um, seized the imagination of so many millions of people. Um, so the piece is, and Mimi's here, and that was our first time working together. So we worked in, a, in an abandoned uh, movie theater, <laughs> and Mimi built like this 25-foot uh, um, Steel and, and uh, steel, it was wood, but it looked like concrete. Uh, uh, it looked like steel and concrete escape stair. And then, really, the whole piece was kind of this meditative piece about going down the stairs, seeing firemen come up, and then starting to panic and think, I really better get down. Uh, and um, you wanted to say something about that piece and how that changed our. It just changed our style, I think. And I might have to back up, too. So uh, I feel like one of the big values in Lecoq training is, is does the, what is the audience receiving? And is it clear? And those are sort of values that you get. Um, and th that's, a, that's sort of an easy thing to test, like, sort of. You, you show an audience something, and then you're like, did you understand what happened? <laughs> Can you tell me what you saw? Um, so that becomes a value for a while. You're like, oh, I really want to make something that's clear. Something about David Brick coming in, he's this choreographer, he, he was like, I felt like he kind of pushed the trajectory of the company a, a little bit less, a little bit away from clarity, maybe brought, brought us back to a land of dance a little bit more. But he was like, but what is the idiosyncratic thing that you want to express through this kind of bizarre um, dreamscape that you're creating in this in this vision that's sort of related to 9/11 and this the people going down the stairs and the firemen going up, um, but it sort of explodes and is more than that. Um, and, and so that the feeling of a of a of the value of clarity would seem to go by the wayside a little bit, and that there was a more of a sense of what is um, what is the idios idiosyncratic, what is the 
personally valuable or personally um, the personal poetics that and how can those be expressed in a way that's both clear but also um, maybe vivid or maybe um, yeah. So yeah, I, I definitely see that trajectory too as, and I don't know if it's about to turn back, the pendulum's about to swing back, but um, it's hard to make something clear in the theater actually. That takes like a lot of work. I think it's a really good thing for young theater makers to do and, and, and hammer themselves about. But I feel like by about 10 years in, uh, both in the people we were working with and ourselves, that we started to be interested in Things that vibrate and you're, you say, I know what that is, but I can't name it. I can't quite put a name on exactly what that is. Um, but I still am looking for states on stage that made people go, um, oh, I really want to keep watching, but, but not because I know exactly what's happening. Um, and yes, so Toshiki Okada is this Japanese um, playwright and director. and. Uh, he, uh, there's a company here in New York called The Play Company that asked me to direct the English language premiere of one of his works. And um, I got so excited about his writing and his uh, crazy movement style, um, which was very much this, that, that we invited him to come make a work with Pig Iron uh, and tried to coax out of him a kind of tra what his training was. Uh, in this movement style, um, because uh, you know, uh, when you've once you've seen a lot, it's it's hard to find something that you really think is genuinely new, that you think, wow, I really haven't seen what this is. And Toshiki's movement, in particular, had this feeling of, I really, I really don't, I I know there's a code going on here, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it is. Um, and so I think we got a little, in, in our collision with him, we made this piece zero cost house, um, uh, which was, yeah, was, a, was an incredible learning experience, but I don't think it fully succeeded. I don't think it reached out to the audience enough. Um, and uh, actually, in order to make this a little bit less academic, uh, we were going to do a bit of a lecture demonstration. And uh, I was going to invite up Jen Kidwell, who's a company member who actually has done very little of this work. Um, so she's a real newbie uh, to this. And to do some of the exercises uh, that we uh, took from Toshiki Okada. So I thought we would take just 20 minutes or so to show you some of that. Um, and uh, yeah, these guys are going, as Dito said, uh, typically in a pig iron, typically we do not show our improvisations <laughs> to uh, outside of the, we just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but here we go doing it. But here we go. <laughs> yes. Because now we're in our third decade, so we're going to break some rules. Yeah. It, we um, Cool. So, but can I just say also, so we'll do this for like a while and then there will be a chance for questions from you guys too. So I didn't say that at the top, but if you're like uh, burning to have them clarify anything, there's a chance for that too, so. Yeah, um, cool. So this is some performance research that we've been playing with in the past few years. I'm gonna be right here. I gotta look at you, right? <laughs> Maybe I can, where can I go? Yeah, I'll be here, off to the side, but just a little bit. In the front. Um, cool. Um, so, little lecture demonstration. Um, to my real surprise, working with Toshiki Okada, he seems to only have two exercises, which go on forever. <laughs> um, Infinite. But I, I just sort of want to, so we'll just have one of you guys. Uh, oh. why no, why don't you let it be you, Jen, just to start, if that's cool. Yes. So, super straightforward. <laughs> Um, all I'm going to ask you to do, uh, where do I begin? So I, I'll just quickly explain that you heard about this play cafeteria, which had no words and no dance. It was all actions. I thought that was the best thing to do. And uh, I banned all narrators from all of our shows. And then I got handed the script by Toshiki Okada, which is only <coughs> narration. There's no action. People just come out and they describe things. And uh, I was 
offended and turned inside out and uh, excited because it was like obsessive in a way that I could relate to. Um, <laughs> so in order to prepare to do his scripts, uh, I would have people come out and just talk. And then it turned out that Toshiki did some of the similar things as well. So uh, Toshiki would say, come out and describe your house uh, to people and make it vivid for us. And so I'm going to ask you to describe your high school. And so you just describe your high school to us. That's it. Uh, my high school was a K through 12 progressive school just outside of Baltimore. It was a school that was started by Jews in 1912 because Jews weren't allowed to go to other private schools. But it wasn't integrated until long after that. Uh, my graduating class had 56 people. I have I'm a twin pause brother. For one sec, just because I'm so distracted by the microphone, which is so oh, weird. Oh, hello. You mind if we take out her lav mic? Is that I, easy? I can turn it off. Hello. No. Oh. Great. Hit it. Oh. So. Okay. Keep going. It's fine. It's all fine. Um. He right. There are 56 people in my graduating class. It was very small, and one of those people was my twin brother. So there were like fewer families. <laughs> represented. Um, the buildings were, there was, okay, so there was a, a road called Old Court Road, off of which you turned to go to my school, and you would go up this rise, and there was a fence, on one side there was like a pasture, I guess, and on the other side there was like a forest or woods, but there were horses, so you would drive past the horses, and like the little mini parking lot by the the athletic field and barn, and then you would go, and then there was like a playground <laughs> for what they call the lower school. Um, they really tried to not use valuative terms, so it, we didn't have high school, we were in the upper school. There was lower school. It's <laughs> 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 like a weird thing. As I say this, I'm like, well, where did I spend my time? Um, <laughs> there were no rules in the school, except that you had to wear shoes. There's no detention. Uh, there's no reciting of any kind of, uh, you know, any separating, you know, talk matter, like a Pledge of Allegiance, for instance. Okay, so I'll uh, pause you for a sec. So thank you so much. So Jen is our super guinea pig, and I just sort of wanted to share the things that Toshiki was looking at and the things Toshiki writes about himself in Zero Cost House, the play that he's a savant and doesn't know what he's doing. So uh, I don't know if this is just my lens on it, but so. Dan's gonna give me notes. No, <laughs> no, no. There's no notes on this one. <laughs> so uh, I feel like Toshiki heard this one anecdote about Brecht and and just took it really seriously about. Uh, that uh, he, he, he really used to talk about this anecdote where Brecht talked about uh, reenacting the accident you were in and then describing an accident that you saw with your own eyes and then describing an accident that you heard about from somebody else and these sort of different degrees of remove. Um, and, I, and, and then actually the, in description, people move between all of these different states seamlessly. Uh, and, I, and I feel like Brecht wanted that in his theater, that he wanted the actor to be able to step out and comment. And, and um, so I guess I just sort of want to sort of track Jen's moves as a describer to us. So first, she puts herself in kind of a 3D. She's got a model, but she's, and she's inside the model. So she, she draws the road, and then the barn is there, and there's stuff over there. Um, and uh, but then she can also make little. She can step out totally seamlessly, like that moment where you stepped out and said, "Now I'm laughing," right? You like did a little um, version of yourself. You're like, "This is what I'm like," <laughs> right? You said, "I'm like I'm like a totally lost person," and isn't that funny? And I share that with you. Um, also, then like she does things where she draws a. Um, you said there was no, and you were trying to separating, and you drew this line. You drew, like your body leaped to help you, basically. Um, and I guess the other thing that I'm quite interested in in this world of describing, which connects 
back to this um, this concept of clown as a separate uh, discipline in which you see the audience. Is all of the complicity, which is a real Lecoq word, uh, a, a, a complicity that she has with us, the way she looks at us and says, you, you really gave us a feeling of the school that the school had an ethos that was really wonderful. I bet you would all agree that it's wonderful, but a little precious. And all of that, and all of that was shared with us as you were, mm -hmm. as you were doing the description was this, I see you and I bet you feel you have this judgment of it. We're sharing yeah. this. Guy. Yes, and, and, and I, I bet you would like, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you about this thing. I do like it, but I also know that it's a little precious. And uh, that coloring to me is related to this problem of the clown to actually be in the theater with the people, to see them. Um, cool. All right, awesome. Cool. So I'll throw Dito up there, uh, and we can, um, and I'll have him just do a quick solo, and then we'll do a, a duet. <laughs> cool. So, uh, so Toshiki Okada's. Uh, I'm gonna just take you through this sort of year of research really quickly. So Toshiki Okada has this movement style that I could not decipher, and this is the best that I could get out of him, basically. Um, and I guess I'll give all, I'll lay all the cards on the table in terms of, basically as people are talking and doing this description in his work and in his company, Chelfish's work, they're moving at the same time as talking in this way that's sort of a gestural, fractal way of moving. And uh, I couldn't quite understand <coughs> it. And when you ask Toshiki about it, he's like a, um, he's very cagey, I think, because he acts like it's totally clear. He says, well, that way of, to me, it's not an obscuring of what's being said, but it's running, he said, a jumper cable directly from my brain to the brain of the audience, from the brain of the actor. So uh, we asked him about these gestures, and one of the things he said, and I think you saw it with Jen, is that when you have a really rich image in your mind, the body leaps to help, and that the image, that the words are last. The image happens. The body comes to help, and then the words come last. Um, and this became even something that then I started thinking about when working on Shakespeare, when you have to do these monologues in Shakespeare that we feel it instinctively if the person says, my heart, and then they, <laughs> and then they touch their heart second, as opposed to this moment where you, you, could, you wanted to talk about this concept about the dividing, and you're like, uh, the body's just there. I see it, the body tries to help, and then eventually I say, divider is the closest word I have. Um, so Toshiki said, well, if there are some of these gestures, can you catch them and repeat them um, and, and sort of turn them into their own gestural song? And he called it catch, well, no. He, we told him it was called catching the fish, and he said, what the hell is that? <laughs> I said, that's what we called what you said, because one day he said, well, in order to hold on to those gestures, you have to hold it with a loose grip, like a, like a fish. Like if you squeeze too tight and hold on to the image too, or the gesture too tight, the fish will die. But if you don't hold it enough, um, it'll, yeah, scamper away. I guess fish don't scamper, but you know what I mean. Um, so why don't I ask you to describe <laughs> your high school, and then when you can catch the fish, catch it. Oof. <laughs> My high school. Okay, uh, I went to a high school. It's a very ugly high school. <laughs> so you drive down this road, and uh, there's a sign that says Langley High School, home of the Saxons. And, uh, <laughs> but then suppose there was a rumor that. Um, the school was designed by a prison designer. And I believe that to be true, because there's something about it that's very like sad. It's very, um, like it's down, down a hill, and um, it's just all like brick and, and uh, nothing very exciting. It's a, it's a very like boxy uh, building. 
the parking lot is huge, just where I learned to drive over here in circles with my dad. Um, and then you, I used to bike to my school. Some, sometimes I would bike. And uh, you, you um, lock your bike up here. You go into the school. Go to your various classes. Uh, how to describe it? it, it this, so there's like a little courtyard, and then there's the drama class room, which is actually the place where I spent most of my time. <laughs> um, and the drama teacher was awesome, Miss Jaffe. And Miss Jaffe, um, she liked me. Start <laughs> catching fish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> she, she liked me, so I liked her. We liked each other. And, uh, and this, you know, I don't want to date myself, but this is this is the '80s, uh, so I was not entirely out in my high school. Uh, so it was very comfortable to be in the drama room because that was what we call these days the safe space. Uh, so there I was uh, with Miss Jaffe, and uh, let's see. There's a in her room. There were lots of posters from. All these shows. She went to London in the summer times, and in the and Edinburgh. All these there was posters all like all the way to the top of the ceilings, and um, she had a stage in the room. <laughs> She'd go up and like actually be on a stage when you did your scenes, and um, or improvisations, or those things where you like get to tag in, freeze, improv tag. Um, <laughs> That was sort of a home. Um, and then around the corner, so there's a room, and her desk is there, and then you come out, and so the rest of the school is all like that way. And I remember feeling like, that's not my school. This is my part of the school. And, uh, and then you turn left, and a little left again, and then you're in the auditorium. Very vivid. Any fish? Any fish? I'm going to try and do some fish now. Okay. Uh, so you go to the right, and then you're in the auditorium. And the auditorium is humongous. The auditorium, I think, sat 800 people, maybe. And uh, so you walk in, it's like, it's very daunting, kind of humongous space. Um, and that's where you would audition for the plays. I remember being super scared the first time. I auditioned for Animal Farm, a play based on George Orwell. <laughs> Novel, I guess, of the same name. Um, and it, uh, so she would sit in the very back, sort of a, a there was a Madame Lafarge kind of feeling. <laughs> she would, she'd be, um, she would, there was a thing that everyone, the students would talk about, like she, she they were like, Ms. Jaffe will be um, knitting. knitting and she'll be looking down. And if your audition is good, she'll look up. <laughs> so that was always like the scary test. It was like, okay, is my audition good enough that she'll look up? <laughs> and I remember the first time uh, she was knitting and I, I don't remember, oh, my aunt, animal farm, I have no memory of that audition at all. Uh, but I was, there was a musical, for the musical, I was auditioning and I came out to sing my song. It was from, um, Man of La Mancha, I was like, took, <laughs> took my spot in the center of the stage, and I remember thinking, I hope she looks up. And she was knitting a sweater, and I was singing my heart out, and giving it all, and she was so, I felt like she was a mile away. I'll pause you. <laughs> it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> well, I'm only looking at style. <laughs> I'm not listening to content. <laughs> Very few fish, yeah? Yeah. It's hard to figure out which ones to grab. Yeah. I, do. I have a little one. Yeah. It's just a weird thing, I know. Yeah. This is why we don't improv in front of people. Um, but um, <laughs> the... Uh, now we've learned about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, just because it's hard to... It's just hard to know when it can happen exactly. I, I do feel like you showed... Like somebody shouted out knitting which is, to me, a fascinating thing about this style of performance, because this is basically what Lecoq would have hated, I think. Tons of fidgeting, tons of extra movement. He, 
the person is often in contact with your memory, really. So you're kind of, your eyes are up and away from us. But I feel like there's still this contact with the audience that can happen that is really different from any other performance territory that we've we, we encountered before. So the, on the one hand, I think if you're looking for theater, it can be kind of irritating. But if you lock in to whatever this state is, I, I've, it, what happened with whoever yelled knitting has happened before. Uh, like I rem like technical when we were warming up to do zero cost house, techies who would never shout out like mm -hmm. union techies in Florida, we were like okay we're done. I did exactly the same thing, and the techies went wait what happened? <laughs> like <all of> a sudden, <laughs> like I was like have to talk. Um, I'll, I'll show a couple more things and then we can do some questions and stuff. Um, I'll throw you up there. We're gonna take away catching the fish. Mm -hmm. I might throw it in. But I thought this was also this very strange. Uh, somebody told me that in Japan, uh, stand, that comedy is actually done in duos much more frequently than, than solos. So, uh, but I actually feel like this is a, something which almost never happens in the American theater, that two people come out and talk to us about one thing. Um, and we started talking a little bit about um, full brain, what it means to throw something at somebody that is like, okay, I really have to think hard about this. Like, like at the very beginning of Dito's discourse on his high school, there was this pause. And I found, I find that pause full, full that, that uh, is like its own kind of acting training that, that uh, almost what happened with me just now as I'm trying, to, I'm, I've got 10 different concepts in my head and I'm trying to pick one and bring it forward to you that in that pause is a certain kind of timing that happens. Um, so some of these questions are these, I throw impossible questions at two people who have to talk to us about them. So my question is, will there always be poverty? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> That's a poor answer, you have to go further. <laughs> Yeah, poor, I guess, means many things. Um, that's, that's part of it, I think. It, part of it is, yeah, that's such a multi, there's so many ways for somebody to be, or for a situation to be impoverished. Um, and like so much interest in keeping things or people impoverished, or keeping things or people in excess. It's one of those things where you're like, oh, if you if you if you just stop with yes, then that feels like a very lame answer, right? Like it's like, well, what about the activation of like how that shouldn't be so, and how like how do I? I don't know. I don't I don't like that I just answered. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's like one of the, it's a question that's. I, I think most people would answer yes to that question, but it's predicated on a certain kind of hope that like, in saying, in answering in a, the affirmative, there's actually like a huge negative feeling that like gets released into the room. Now we all feel like, well, perhaps all feel like <coughs> down. So it's, it's a really tough, that's a really tough affirmation to throw at. People. Makes me think about the election. <laughs> <That's a tough laughs> thing. Another thing to talk about. Um, <laughs> it makes me think. It's hard to imagine it. I'm trying to imagine like it. I mean, I guess there have been communes or like communities where people all were like. But I feel like a. I've never, it doesn't seem like it, it travels outward. In terms of size, it feels like maybe that works on a small scale for a short period of time. But it doesn't. Some people. I mean, because it's not even like, it could be pretty simple in a way to, to end like poverty for talking about, like, 
economic poverty. It's like very like Bert and Ernie did it with the cherries. You know, you have a scale. <laughs> like one side of the scale has one cherry, and the other side of the scale has a whole bunch of cherries. You just move some of the cherries over to the other side, and then it balances everything out. But well, we don't do that, so <laughs> we must not be interested in doing that. Are that's a, been for forever. Are you more of a Bert or an Ernie? Ernie? <laughs> <laughs> What's the little one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm so tall today. I feel like yeah. my spirit animal. Ernie? Ernie. Hey, Bert. Hey, Bert. <laughs> yeah. so Bert. Bert's like the, Bert's like a type yeah. yeah, he's got the pointy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the top, on the top. Now you're describing me. <laughs> um, cool. Oh, sorry. I guess, um, so Toshiki makes dances, and I'm just sort of starting to figure out how to make dances out of all of those body gestures that are describing systems, like the way you describe the the feeling, right? The the the, the hope that got like that negative that then got released into the room, you know. Um, and you just did a big one with your hands as well. I don't remember what it was. Um, and then I got really interested in this really strange relationship, which I, you don't get to see in drama very often, where like status keeps changing between who's who. Like when she says the burden earning thing, you look out like to everyone. Like, oh, she, I don't know if I'm going to get on board. That's a dumb thing to say. Um, and the way that they check in with each other all the time about the morality. Is this OK to say? Is it morally right to say? Is it too much of a bummer to say? Yeah. Um, do we have time for one last one? Or yeah, what should we do? One last one. Oh, this goes on too long, doesn't it? All right, so here's an impossible one. And uh, this, like I said, was a year, and you've never done this. So this actually reminds me of some <laughs> of these um, constraints that I did for cafeteria. So we started talking to Toshiki about the idea of extra. And he had written this play called Are We the Undamaged Others? where a dude shows up in the middle of the play and says, I'm not happy, you're happy, but I'm not happy. And then he sits there for the whole time. And we just sort of loved that idea that there would be this extra stuff. Again, it's kind of the rebellion against Lecoq and clarity. Um, so we started talking about extra movement. And this is really like raw research that we have not figured out how to put into a play yet. So uh, again, I'm going to lay out the rules right now, which I think would be very different if you didn't know the rules, but I'm going to throw it out there. So I'm going to hit you guys with a full brain problem again. One person, when the other person is talking, like everybody noticed how Dito did all kinds of fidgeting while Jen was talking, big, big fidgeting. Um, but that's part of, um, part of how you're <coughs> there, right? And part of how you're thinking about what you're going to say and listening and then in front. So, uh, in, in that world of fidgeting, you're going to create waste movement, meaning extra movement. And so this movement does not illustrate what Jen says. It does not erase what Jen says. And it's not just a fun dance. Um, so this is this strange formal obsession we found three years ago that we still don't know what to do with. Um, so now i got to give you guys a... Um, Possible question. question. Uh, great. So, what do you owe your parents? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I. I don't know. I feel like I'm in a very. I know so many stories. <laughs> bad parents, but I happen to have pretty good parents. So I feel pretty lucky that like, I can fully, I mean, not always, but I can pretty fully <laughs> embrace owing them and feeling the gratitude. However, my mother had a mother who kind of tortured her and was really mean to her. Partly because she was an alcoholic. And so, um, I don't know, that got very serious. But, uh, <laughs> but I do feel like, oh, 
sometimes you you can feel that that debt and you want to pay it and you find ways to do that. And there are other ways where you have to sort of jump, say thank you, and now we're done. Yeah, I mean, I, it's uh, it's different for everybody. Um, I feel like I owe my, like one thing you really. I owe my parents, I shouldn't say you, but I owe my parents like a lot of time and I feel really grateful for that because that's the one thing that you can't get back. Um, and they put a lot of time into me and that was very nice of them. Um, <laughs> I mean, other stuff too, but like I guess at some point I could like tally it all up and give them back a bunch of food and money and clothes. Just sort of like to fall from a big bat and land. But uh, I can't take, I can't give them back time and regard. And um, and like support. Yeah. I like beyond support. And is it, it's weird how in um, the United States in particular, when people get really old, you send them away to a place where they get taken care of by strangers. Mm. I don't know if you always do that, but you often, I mean, that's the cultural norm. And uh, I don't know, I guess there is some thought that like, oh, the, in fact, I have a friend who's going back to India to take care of his parents because he's the youngest child. And there's a tradition there of like, if you, you're the youngest child, that's your, when they get too old, they, they need care. That's your job. Whereas here, I think it's much more, um, you just throw money at the problem. <laughs> a positive. Cool. Um, lovely. Um, the uh, so I'm still trying to figure out what that is. It's like it's sort of a, an impossible. It's both an impossible problem that I threw at you to think about and an impossible formal problem. Like like if I was in the rehearsal room, if we were working this for two hours, I would be like, oh, there's 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 illustrations that happen, right? Like you went like that right when she said something about throwing that time is gone mm -hmm. or something. But it's almost haphazard, right? And then there's the, but there was sort of, oh yeah. But it feels like, I don't know, I wonder if it feels like that's okay if, it's, if it doesn't feel too one-to-one. -one. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And you can also hold on to it a little bit, so. And what happens when you start really, like, <clears throat> if you're really like together with somebody, and this thing you were talking about before, that the image comes before, and you start anticipating what they're going to say in your body, and like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that can happen too. Yeah. So uh, I think we're to wrap up our evening. We're going to thank you guys so much. But Becca, why don't we? We'll Please. all sit up here now, yeah? We'll all sit up here Please now. Including Mimi, yeah. Including Mimi, Cleo. So, yeah. Should I just quickly introduce yeah, you? Yeah, why don't you? So this is Mimi Lian. She's a scenic designer. And I, I think I introduced Jen Kidwell. And uh, yeah, I guess that's all we need. Well, I, maybe we could start we're, we're by. All, this is also most of the current company that is Pig Iron. Yeah. So I think it might be interesting for you guys to know how Mimi and Jen came to be a part of it, or what their origin story with Pig Iron, kind of how we started before. So maybe Mimi can mm -hmm. tell how you got here yeah. with these guys. So, yeah, I first met Dan in, and you were the first person I met of the company, I believe, and it was in 2005, and um, 
I had worked in Philadelphia for the first time, uh, designed a play at the Wilma Theater, I think the year before that. And, uh, and I think Quinn saw the show and knew that you guys were looking for a designer for this new project, Love Unpunished. And so we uh, had coffee and we, we met and we, uh, I think we talked about Rube Goldberg <laughs> and like a few different, uh, I don't know, point common points of reference. Um, I, I guess partly, you know, because you told me the story about, you know, how you've been thinking about what it feels like to, to just continuously go down to physically, what it must feel like physically for people to walk down 60 flight of stairs. Um, and uh, this was something that you had been wrestling with. And uh, I guess maybe, I don't know, my background is in architecture. So I, you know, th think a lot about the kind of emotional and psychological implications of space and moving through space. So that problem that you threw out and this question of like, you know, how does that space affect the psychology and the physicality, you know, how does that physicality in turn affect their emotional and psychological state? And I was super excited about that. Um, so we ended up working on that project and, uh, and, it, and I guess I'll just mention, I can talk more about this later, but it was the first time that I had worked with an ensemble company that created devised work together. Um, I had only been really working as a set designer for about three years. I had no previous experience in theater. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't studied theater in college. I had studied architecture. I didn't know that that was something I wanted to do. Um, and so... I hadn't had a lot, a lot of experience um, in different ways of making theater, and my encounter with Pig Iron was the first time that I had encountered making theater in this way, and it's totally, I feel like it was a, it totally changed the trajectory of, uh, of all of my work. I feel like the crazy thing that happened is Mimi made tons of models of these stairs I mean, a lot of models, <laughs> <laughs> like models. like at least seven main models. Yeah. <laughs> and we kept obsessing about should the stairs exit with the people facing front and should they descend <coughs> or should the stairs exit with the people facing away from us? Yeah. And then we grabbed some stairs at the Wilma Theater and we rented the Wilma for there. We took the no, stairs and is, we went to the This was actually magic. up at Yale. We had a workshop up at Yale. And that was actually the first workshop that I okay, you invited to. us to. And we sat on the stairs. There were all those weird mm -hmm. stairs in that building. You had no, you had borrowed a stair unit from the theater department. I remember it was so vivid because this was like a huge like aha moment for me actually. Like I think about this moment all the time. Uh, I remember being in this rehearsal room and you had this set of rehearsal stairs. Yeah. And I remember you, Dito, actually like you, you had asked everyone to do this exercise, right? So first we had place the stairs going sideways, and so people would walk up and down it in profile. And I think we knew that uh, the, the structure of the piece was going to be very much like a loop, right? People were going to descend the stairs, and then they would descend the stairs again, and we would have this feeling that we were watching them and following them descend the stairs of the building. So you had everyone kind of cycle through uh, and walk down the stairs and do something, and I remember feeling like the profile was kind of disappointing and kind of blah. Like it felt very um, normal, like the way you normally see stairs on a theater stage, right? It's often like in profile. So then we turned the stairs and had the stairs coming towards the audience as the performer was descending them. And I remember vividly Dito descending. And as he was descending, you know, they were all just making proposals, physical proposals. And I feel like you, you did this thing where you, you patted your heart as you were descending. And somehow like that, in combination with uh, the orientation of the stairs, it just was hugely impactful. Like it felt completely different from the stairs going sideways. Mm. And then we also tried it again with the stairs going uh, facing away from the audience. And that was the first time that I, I as a designer, got to play in, in full scale with live performers, right? Because, you know, we build models and we can look at the model piece facing this way and that way, but 
to be in on the process with the performers and performer creators and everyone kind of making this thing together, that was the first for me. So I, I think about that day like all the time. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> Jen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, oh, we were just talking about this earlier. I, um, w I was living here and saw a piece called Machines, 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 Machines. That is a pig iron, I guess, like affiliated piece. Quinn was in it and um, Jeff Sobel and Trey Lyford, and I really liked it. And because I saw that piece, I got put on Pig Iron's uh, mailing list. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I saw Chekhov's Lizard Brain, which I also really liked, and they're very different pieces. And I was like, whoa, this is so crazy, this work these people are making. Woo. And, uh, and I. You should turn on your mic. Is that what the gestures yeah. oh, that no, have a meaning on. are saying over there? Yeah, you should turn it on. Hello? So then. Uh, and I felt I was here, and I felt like I was really spinning my wheels. Like I, like wasn't really able to like live off of, of performing, or and I wanted to be making stuff, and I didn't know how. And then I ended up taking this trip with my brother, and we ended up at uh, whatever. I ended up seeing all this theater in Europe, and I was like, man, it seems like people are making really great stuff in Germany. I think I'm going to move to Germany. And I, <laughs> I, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, like found this theater company online and like wrote this letter that was like <laughs> it was literally was like I don't speak German but I promise I'll learn. Um, <laughs> I would love to come work with you people. I I don't know. We'll figure it out. And then in the meantime, I kept getting these emails from Pig Iron saying we're starting a school. We're starting a school. And I was like, that's really nice. Those people make really great work. I wish I could afford to go to their school. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna apply. And if I get in, I will go to Philly and figure this out, money thing. And if I don't, I'll move to Berlin. So part of the application process, <laughs> part of the application process involves a conversation with one Quinn Bowerdale, who is not here right now. No. And on the phone, this man told me, I was like, he was like, yeah, you know, what's going on? And I was like, yeah, well, I was thinking about moving to Berlin. I just really want to learn how to make my own work. And uh, I think, I saw some things coming out of that country that I found really inspiring. And Quint Bordeaux looked, no, he didn't look me in the face, we were on the phone. Right, so. <laughs> he said, with no irony, oh, well that's interesting because I like to think Philadelphia is the Berlin of North America. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, really? And he was like, oh yeah. <laughs> I ended up getting in the school, and then I was taught by these people, and Mimi came for a day. But I had already met in Europe, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, yeah, now I'm hooked. Great. <laughs> so I think I'm a little unclear on when we need to end. I feel like I should be the person watching that. So I think we should open to audience questions pretty soon. Um, but I, I think I want to just throw one question to you guys that I was interested in in thinking about what I wanted to hear you talk about, which is, um, I guess because I feel like it's really hard for me to draw a through line through Pig Iron's work, except for some mysterious things like how when you go to their show, you have to figure out what this one's going to be like, and it's not going to be like the other ones. I, I have a question for you guys, which is, what do you have in common? The shows, or what do we you, have in common? You, all of you. Because I think that maybe if you can name it, it will help us understand what pig iron is. Huh. <laughs> in, my, in my school, we had to say the Pledge of Allegiance every day. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> it's not that. It's, it's not that. Um. He's INTJ. <laughs> nerds. All four of these people are nerds. <laughs> and fifth, no. actually. <laughs> but I think um, that, I don't know, that's part of it. Definitely all of these people are folks that I can talk about ideas with, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this other feeling of, I mean, I almost, it feels cliche to me now, and I guess I don't know if it is really, but this idea of a spirit of play, mm -hmm. which is something Lecoq used to talk about, but I feel like 
you're not really going to be part of pig iron if you don't have a, a spirit of play. Um, so, so I guess there is this feeling of um, ideas matter. This isn't just this, this funny thing also, right? I mean, it's a little bit a place for refugee intellectuals, right? Like intellectuals that became artists. Like people, I do feel like all, all of you guys care about ideas maybe more than me. <laughs> um, um, even though I think of myself as someone who's like, well, at the same time, it's a, it's a uh, you know, we're doing a, Mimi and I are artists in residence at UPenn, and we just met with, for this year, in the program in environmental humanities, and we, um, we were working with, uh, Andrew is from the public, and he has a sheet for how devising companies could work, like, let's talk, and let's talk about our internal um, language. And I said, you know, oh, people at UPenn, we say that's just an idea. We say that's academic. Not that ideas are not important, but there are some ideas that only exist in an essay. And then there are ideas that are right for the theater. And I guess I feel like, to put words in your mouths, I don't know that I've heard you guys say this, but I know that I could, I feel like we could all talk about that. We could say that's an idea, that's an important idea, and then this is, how do you, how do you turn that into theater? That would be my answer. Mm -hmm. We all yeah. like dumplings. And <laughs> Yeah, maybe picking up on that. I, I feel like um, like the idea of doing research, I, I feel like that's maybe really important to all of us. And, and I feel like the process in which the work is made feels like a kind of ongoing, uh, this kind of elaborate <laughs> research. You know, like we went to, when we worked on uh, Zero Coast House with Tishi Fiolkata, we all went to Japan on this research trip and I don't know, I, I personally feel like um, I love, re like that's my favorite part of working on any project is kind of like soaking up as much of the unknown of, of things that I don't know as possible. And, and I, I feel like that is a big part of that rehearsal process of like, oh, of, of kind of not knowing, of allowing yourself to be in a place of not knowing and absorbing and then uh, kind of creating this, this world together that feels. Um, I think we should open it for questions from the sure. people. Um, yeah. I think someone's going to have a mic. Sometimes. We are live streaming. So, so since we are live streaming and millions of people are tuned in right uh -huh. now <laughs> online, we need it all on the mic. So um, I remember Swarthmore in the 90s being there. and uh, and. A lot of what you guys are talking about and have persisted in is a lot of what was engendered there at the time. And around in Philly and even around the country, there was a paucity of that mindset. Um, and I was just wondering what has allowed you guys to persist to kind of keep that mentality, the ensemble and the theater of the ideas um, over all this time period, because 20 years is, is quite an achievement considering how far away that seems now. Well, this is one of my favorite anecdotes. Mm. <laughs> There was a moment where, um, what year had we hit? Like maybe 15, 14, 15? And a, a Romanian man who, who teaches at Colgate University um, was like, well, let's we'll see if you last much longer. <laughs> we were like, what? <laughs> he was like, you know, theater, theater company, life of a dog. <laughs> we are like, what? <laughs> Can you explain that? He was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ensemble lasts maybe plus minus life of dog. Maybe 15 years, maybe 16. You're about to end. <laughs> it was really like, da da da. And, um, and I'm really grateful to him that he said that because there was a way in which, um, like with anything that lasts a long time, you have to keep sort of reinventing and um, I think already built into the DNA of us, of us working project to project and delving deep into new things that we don't know how yet to do. There's already a kind of um, continual renovation, re um, rediscovery. But then um, I think that was a moment for us also to like, really think about um, how we wanted the company to continue. And that was maybe the moment when there was talk of us starting a school and 
Um, yeah, it's one of those things where where it is it is hard to keep a group of people together and um, to keep, especially with an ensemble where you want people to feel empowered, but also to like take a that this empowered group also takes um, projects in a in a real direction rather than like continually discussing. So um, I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> the, the the feeling uh, the 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 this sort of way of making projects, um, I think, helped us last for 20 years. And then also getting these um, wake-up calls and like, you have to just keep um, changing up the formula a little bit so that you, it, it remains exciting and it remains new. Part of our formula is to bring in these outside wild cards like Toshiki Okada um, and um, just make sure that we're not always having the same group of folks driving each other crazy. I think we were really lucky that we landed in Philadelphia um, mm -hmm. uh, just at, at that moment where they're really where the city was sort of at the end of 25 years of population loss and so little was happening that, that um, we could be a big fish in a small pond and um, Philly is now I mean I, I even then I think it's very hard to keep an ensemble together in New York City because of the cost of real estate, <coughs> cost of living for both the artists and for the, the theater itself. Um, and uh, I, I guess, it, I guess th Philly is changing. We're in the middle of, a, of the first construction boom in, I don't know, 50 years. And there's a lot of um, economic uh, migrants from <laughs> New York City. Uh, people that I thought would be connected to downtown New York theater forever are moving to Philadelphia in their 30s and 40s because it's a quarter of the cost. Um, but that's changing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, I'm a Philly booster anyway. <laughs> the cafeteria is great too. <laughs> cool. Great. great. Next question. Yeah. Uh, Dan, in 2009, I heard you say something along the lines of you wanted to know how much you needed to make the audience laugh before you could slap them in the face and they would stay put. Um, and maybe that's, that may not be something you still believe or are still interested in, but I, I see your work deals with a lot of difficult questions for the audience. Um, and this is a question for everybody. Um, and uh, not shying away from the hard questions of life and finding humor as a way in, and I was wondering if you could expand on that or re reject it entirely. Sure, I guess. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> Although I guess, so, uh, so I, we really were also lucky to, uh, we pulled Joe Chaikin out of retirement post stroke to make a piece with us when we were 25 years old ish uh, and um, he had aphasia and uh, he spoke in haikus because <laughs> uh, aphasia is he had a kind of brain damage where he understood everything but he couldn't make syntax work so he spoke in these haikus and one of our favorite things he said to us was me 95% funny Right? 95% funny. Prefer. Prefer. 95% funny. And, and, and I think we really felt like, well, we just got a permission slip to make it 95% funny. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's mostly just a question of, I feel like the artists that I've really connected to really thought about the function of what we're doing as waking people up. Um, from Joe's fascination with Beckett, and I was thinking about, and then, and then Toshiki's fascination with Beckett. Also, he has a play where everybody's falling asleep on a train and what if nobody woke up. And, uh, and so I think in that job of trying to wake people up, you got laughing is, is the quickest way, I think, to wake people up. Um, so, so yeah, I think I still care about that for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. Where do you guys? It was a question for everyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was moving along. No. 
I mean, I certainly there's um, there's always the danger of of theater becoming pretentious. So I feel like humor is one of the best ways to just be like, hey, we're all here. We're not taking it too too seriously. Now we can delve into something um, without feeling like we're being very precious about it. Um, I don't know, Sometimes that's... humor allows you to take something actually like more seriously. I think that's like my big question for humor now is doesn't it allow us to actually really say the truth and then we have a physical reaction to the truth but like laughing is the same muscles as crying so we're doing the same thing it's just the provocation maybe feels a little bit different but I think it just allows us I definitely don't think of it as less valuable I think that that can be really sublime in the audience like my own experience as an audience member was like oh I'm, I'm, I'm in a sublime moment when I'm really, really laughing. Yeah. That can happen as well. I'm going to take you and then you. Oh, yeah, let's start over here. I have a question about the catching fish game that you guys played. Were, Dita, were you turning up the fidgeting? Was that part of the idea? Was that you were moving more? Or were you trying to catch movements that came up out of this problem of trying to say something with your body before the idea came out of your mouth? Probably both, but what I'm really <laughs> trying to do is this, is I think the second, which is, is to, um, and I don't know that I did it particularly well, but the, um, that an unplanned movement that comes out of what I'm trying to express verbally then starts to either repeat or I'm trying to do it right now a little bit. <laughs> um, that, and then I, I'm continuing. It's, all, it's a little bit like the game of um, I'm patting my head and, and rubbing my stomach. That there's like um, my body is almost choreographically is doing something uh, it, with more repetitions than would be normal. It's a little uncanny. But it, it feels a little bit like a surrealist moment where, where it's based on something, um, an impulse that is real. So... Um, that the, uh, yeah, it's, you know, is that clear? So, so the idea is to like capture something and then repeat it as part of the research while the mind keeps moving. And while the words it. keep moving. Okay. Well, one yeah. of my favorite things that I've heard Toshiki Okada say, and you said like, it's a little bit surrealist. So he said to me once, you know, sometimes people call me a surrealist because it seems like these two things that are unrelated are juxtaposed. And, um, and the first time I saw Toshiki's work, it was like two office workers having a conversation at a water cooler, and they were doing this movement, which had been generated through a process like that, but it seemed like it was its own separate score that was like on a different track from the very banal conversation that they were having. And so he said to me, yeah, some people call me a surrealist because these two things that seemingly have no relationship are juxtaposed, but actually what I'm doing is put, I'm putting a black box over the connection. <laughs> so it's like the two things are connected at this junction box, but I'm putting a black box over it. So like somehow, <laughs> I love that. Well, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, sort of actually related to the theme of the Prelude Festival this year, because you guys often go into questions that you don't know how to answer, there's inevitably failure. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about like favorite failures or how failure has come into your process as something that you like roll with and work with and can get excited by. Because it's something I, I remember from working with. Well, I can say. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I mean, I won't speak for about the company, but the school is, you know, that, that's, there's like so many failures that you, that there's so many failures happen in so many different uh, registers, like, oh, man, that improv is really too bad, too. So I just spent two weeks working on this piece, and <laughs> you told me it, it's not, it's no good, it's not doing what I thought it was going to do. Um, and so personally, what that's opened up in me is uh, you stop feeling defeated by failure. It doesn't feel 
better necessarily, but it's not a defeat. Like, I'm you know, like thinking about the election. I'm like, that's not a defeat. It's just a stumbling block. Mm. Um, but the, the, there's like more permission to do more things that may go horribly, horribly awry. Um, and in, in that breadth of trying, then maybe something you weren't expecting gets to creep in. Um, and the, the skin is certainly thicker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's definitely projects that didn't work, but that collaborations were born out of it. Like, I think you might have worked on Canker Blossom, which, is, yeah. which was a puppet piece that just didn't come together that we worked on really hard. <laughs> um, and uh, Rosie Langabeer had showed up on a crazy whim. Like she shouldn't have even been in this country, this yeah. composer who then composed, became really central to our 12th night with a live Balkan band, became like one of the most special parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, we just finished a piece, we, we three, uh, called I Promised Myself to Live Faster, where I had this amazing team of artists and an amazing idea that really works as a joke but may not work as a play. <laughs> Somebody over there really liked the play. I think it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, about uh, you know a planet of pregnant nuns. It was a gay sci-fi fantasy, a planet of pregnant nuns who only give birth to homosexuals um, and their search for the holy gay flame, which sounds like it's gonna be really fun. Um, but somehow I think that project got really overburdened in a way, we had too many geniuses on board. And uh, we're sort of spinning off a secret project with just these two guys that's trying to be a return to Charles Ludlum, who was the inspiration for that project. Um, oh. And uh, it's uh, right now, the project is only the name of the exercise we've done, which is called Quick Change Dum Dum. And really, all it is is these two people improvising quick changes and being as dumb as possible and trying to have sex with each other. <laughs> that is the whole project, and it is improvised. <laughs> We've only worked on it for three days. This is terrible. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna throw it, and we're gonna throw it together, and we're gonna perform it at a, a gay club that also does um, drag Golden Girls. Um, it called Taboo in, in Philly for 50 people. And, and it's a big departure for me and us in that um, it's going to be improvised. It's not going to be mm -hmm. tightened on the screws. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a failure that um, we're like trying to turn into. I know there's lots of life in, in all that. There's a failure that I particularly love, which is Check Out Lizard Brain version one. So I don't know if people saw Check Out Lizard Brain, but it was. Um, so it was this piece where we where we created various um, <laughs> acting. Did you say stuff. what that guy said? What after the showing? What did, what did he say? We said, "What did you see after a check of Lizard Brain?" And somebody <laughs> said, with full earnestness, raised their hand from the back, like maybe this was what we were going for. <laughs> uh, Beckett performed by retard. <laughs> 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 Which really maybe that could be our our tagline. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. I wasn't thinking of that. Oh, okay. That was, really <laughs> that, was that was the first showing. That was very funny. Uh, um, so there was there was a version we showed that was too basically it's too hard to go into, but it was it was too there were too many um, there were too many elements. It was a little bit overburdened. This version of Check Out Lizard Brain. We showed it. Cynthia Hopkins really liked this version, but. Other than that, people are like, it's so complicated, I don't know what it is. And then um, James, who played Chekhov as a Brain, and Quill and you went off and kind of woodshedded it. And <clears throat> like kind of, speaking of clarity, they went back to sort of like, what is, it, what is the clarity of what happens to this one person through the telling of this, of the story of this play? And then we, it was like we had all the like, Elements that could obfuscate what what um, what the story is, but then we also had the the clear line of what is the what is the story itself. So um, that was the moment the version that is now um, the version uh, came to be. So that it actually took ensemble working together, all five of us, 
a lot of designers putting in their their many cents, and then like and then an, a version premiering, and then more time. And so there was a failure, but there was there was enough of a success that we were like, there's a there's one more turn of the wheel, and that's what they did um, on their own. And then we came back and workshop a little bit more, and then we were able to kind of like finally put the make it into the show that it wanted to be. Maybe um, one last question or comment. Uh, maybe Richard, if you're, if you're with us. Oh. <laughs> if you want, if you want, if you want to. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm Let's happy take the listening. Happy listening? Yes. <laughs> well, one last. I have a last question, if yeah. no one's jumping. I mean, I feel like since this is the, you know, sort of 20th anniversary and we've talked a lot about origins and where you guys came from, I think it might be interesting to hear about what's, what's next, what comes next. Are there 20 more years? What comes next right now? Like, what are you, what are you imagining for the future? Well, we're making this crazy piece. <laughs> quick change done about it? The quick change, oh, the one that you just talked about. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we're making a piece. <laughs> Um, with this composer named Troy Harian, which is going to have a children's choir, an elder choir, a chamber orchestra in it. And um, it's, uh, it's called A Period of Animate Existence. It's in five movements, like a classical symphony. And uh, it's going to really, uh, it's going to be the first piece we've ever done that really brings together through composed music with classically trained musicians. Uh, and it is about children, elders, and machines contemplating the future, uh, which is a roundabout way of saying that it's about climate change and about um, a period of animate existence is uh, in the, Wiki in the like, Wikipedia definition of life um, is what that is. And uh, it is definitely this attempt to um, put, uh, look for something which you, you know what it is, but you can't name it. Um, and uh, a wondering about very elemental forces like the force of life as a total force, the force of gravity as a total force. Um, it's a real dare in terms of this thing about, well, that's a good idea. I've read some wonderful essays and poems about that, but can we turn that into something that vibrates theatrically? So um, we're aiming to premiere that in September, um, but it's a heavy lift, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Great. Well, um, I would like to say thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for the Picard and Company for coming and for putting it together. Um, I just little plug for the Seagull. We actually brought Toshiki Okada over here when he was a very young, unknown playwright. We did not do the first reading. I double checked, but the first one didn't work out. And then the play company asked you. So, in some way, the Seagull Center also is connected, which makes us very happy that it had such a um, big influence. As far as I know, he also often copies movement. Someone does an exercise, the other actor has to memorize what the actor did and uses it for his own words, but not in a psychological way. So um, it's a fantastic uh, approach he has. But uh, again, thank you and our congratulations on 20 years of work as an ensemble. It's uh, uh, hopefully life of a tortoise and not uh, of a dog. <laughs> and uh, it's, you have our uh, respect for it. We we'll love to see your work and I hope you will continue. And again, thank you all for coming and uh, for being here. And let's have a little glass of wine to celebrate that really remarkable uh, achievement of a company that uh, has been together for over 20 years now. So thank you, and thank you, Richard, for being in your class and everybody.